Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. We're going to begin today in what might seem a rather strange passage of scripture, but in effect it isn't. It's right on track. I'm going to start in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 8 through 10. Here's what it says. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. You see, the effect of sin is to make a person afraid of God. The effect of sin is to cause a person to want to hide, to avoid God, to, to run away from God. And you can see that here in this Garden of Eden experience. The effect of sin in the experience of Adam and Eve is the same effect of sin in your life and in mine. We want to avoid God, to run the other way. Now, what then is the greatest miracle? Well, the greatest miracle is this, that a person who by nature wants to avoid God, but now, instead of avoiding God, instead of looking to hide from God, instead of being afraid of his voice, that person now turns around and walks straight to God without fear, and with love and says, Lord, here I am. That is the greatest miracle. I'll tell you, the miracle of conversion is a greater miracle than the miracle of the creation of this world. See, because when God spoke to the mass of the world and said, let there be light, let them, there be trees, let there be this, let there be that, those elements had no will to resist. But when God speaks to us and we respond, you see, we have the right to turn him down. So when a human heart is converted, that's a greater miracle than the creation of the whole world. It's easy for God to make a world because the world didn't have a will. But you and I, we have a will. It's a beautiful miracle. In fact, there's nothing like it in the world, the miracle of a changed life. Now we're going to open our Bibles in a portion of Scripture, and I would invite you, if uh, you have your Bibles, to follow along. We're going to go look in the Gospel of John in chapter 18 and 19, and this is the most dramatic portrayal of the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ that is contained within the Gospels. So I'm going to read a portion of John chapter 18, beginning down at verse 28, to John 19, verse 16. The Jewish leaders led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Roman governor's palace. It was early in the morning so that they could eat the Passover. The Jewish leaders wouldn't enter the palace. Entering the palace would have made them ritually impure, so Pilate, went out to them and asked, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered, If he had done nothing wrong, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate responded, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jewish leaders replied, The law doesn't allow us to kill anyone. This was so that Jesus' word might be fulfilled when he indicated how he was going to die. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So 
you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So let's go back to the judgment hall and, and see what was going on there. That crowd is roaring out, Crucify him, crucify him. You see, that's the way it always is with the crowd. The crowd will always cry out, Crucify Jesus. The crowd is always ignorant of truth. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent, but he couldn't stand for what he knew to be the truth. They crucified the Lord of truth. If you in your heart know what the truth is and refuse to follow it, at that point, you too crucify the Lord. And you and the Lord who is the Lord of truth, have thus parted company. The moment you leave what you know to be truth, you've left your Lord. You've left them at that point. That's why it's deadly serious and it's done so quietly in the silence of a person's own soul. If you're going to wait for the crowd to accept Jesus, you'll never do it. The crowd, they're always crucifying the Lord. Now let's go a step further. Not only was the crowd ignorant, but there were two classes of very religious people there. And the first of these that I would like you to look at were called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were intensely religious people. Now why would they hate Jesus? They were religious people. So why hate Jesus? Why did they want to crucify him? Well, because... In spite of their religious devotion, Jesus was telling them that their church was not adequate. He was telling them that that beautiful church down on the corner was not living up to the expectation of God. Now, no one, whether it's this year or back there, nobody likes to be told that their churches are not reaching God's standards. And of course... They hated him for it. Jesus upset their church. They felt that Jesus was an extremely dangerous man, and to allow him to go on was, in fact, to upset the established religious order. The Pharisees crucified Jesus because they could not bring themselves to turn their backs upon the religious education of a lifetime because it really takes a miracle. Few people can do it. You see, follow the truth, no matter where it leads, because Jesus is the truth. Now, why did the Pharisees crucify Jesus? Well, it was certainly not for want of evidence. Do you know that Jesus, he went around, right, and taking the most seriously sick people, 
some of which sat at the very gates of the temple, and he healed them. They wouldn't accept the evidence. It was not for want of evidence that Jesus had come from God that they crucified him. The evidence was overwhelming. In fact, in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John is the record of the resurrection of Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. And if you recall, his family says to the Lord, you know, he's already stinking, right? Don't ask that they roll the stone away. But the Lord said, roll the stone away. So they rolled it away. Now, there was a crowd outside the tomb, and out, they were, that crowd was filled with religious people. And they stood there, everyone holding their breath, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And they watch. And there's this man coming out of the tomb, all bandaged up. And Jesus said, loosen him and let him go. And at that point, you would think that it would be perfectly normal that, that, that those people would say, well, that's the most marvelous thing I've ever seen in my life. Lord, you are the son of God. You have the power to raise the dead. But it didn't happen that way. This is the most astonishing thing. Listen to this. It says in John chapter 11, verse, verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus gave the evidence, the most powerful evidence that he was the son of God. And you would think that the evidence would have settled the question, but it didn't because they didn't want to accept the evidence. The evidence is not what they wanted to believe. Notice that because they didn't want to accept the evidence, they crucified the Lord who presented the evidence. And that's exactly the way it is today. It's not for the want of evidence that people crucify Jesus today. The evidence is overwhelming on what the truth is. But it takes a miracle. Let's look briefly at the second group of religious people in the city. They were there at the judgment hall. Also, they were called the Sadducees. The high priest and most of the council belonged to this group. These people were the ones who owned the money tables in the temple. Those were the tables that, you remember, Jesus turned over and he scattered the sheep and he let the turtle doves go. Now, why did these people want to crucify Jesus? Well, because he threatened their business, their comfortable way of life. Jesus was a threat to them. He interfered with their business. You see, when a person comes face to face with the requirements of God and puts the Lord Jesus ahead of every dollar consideration, then that's a miracle. It really is. Now, let's go back and look at Pontius Pilate because most of our story here in the Bible is about Pilate. Pilate was not a man who was noted for his justice. This was very early in the morning. They come to his palace. They beat on the door. You know, Pilate gets up. He's rubbing the sleep out of his eyes. He was not in a very good mood. His attitude was when he came out, he said, well, just go ahead and do whatever you want with him. But Pilate was in for a surprise. Never had he seen in all his life a man with the transparent goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no defiance. There was no boldness. There was no fear. There was no evidence of guilt. Jesus was dignified. And from the very beginning, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. You see it clearly there. He tries to set Jesus free. Now, may I make a comment here? Is it amazing that a pagan Roman governor could see the truth easier than the established church? Is that a message here? Is that the message of this chapter? Could it be that God is saying to us here that that's the message contained in this chapter? 
But let's look at Pilate again. In the story that we've just read, we have a picture of a man that's going in and out, back and forth. He's in a panic. And that's amazing. Because here is a man in whom is vested all of the authority of the Roman Empire. And he's acting in this strange in and out, you know, I can't quite figure it out. It's hard to explain. But think of it. Think of it this way. When an individual meets the Lord Jesus Christ, something happens. I can't explain it, but it always happens. Jesus has this effect on people. So here is this man. He is struggling with his own conscience. He is agonizing about a decision. What is he going to do with this man that he knows is innocent? He knows this man is the truth. And several times he declares Jesus to be innocent. So what is the real problem? Well, Pilate knows what is right. And he's struggling over the question of whether he should do what is right. And that's the fight we all fight. Pilate was fighting it. You know, are you trying to decide what to do about Jesus? Will you be able to stand alone with Jesus? Or are you just willing to go along with the crowd? If you listen to the shouts of the crowd, that's not the truth. They say, don't get involved. If we listen to the ignorant crowd, the crowd will always cry out, crucify him. We must learn. If we're going to get into the kingdom of God, we've got to learn to shut our ears to what people say. You see, Pilate was listening to the crowd and you can never take the question of what to do with Jesus back to the crowd. If Pontius Pilate had only acted on his own conscience, let his own conscience tell him what to do, and not let the other people push him around, it would have been a different story. But he didn't do that. He yielded to the pressure of the crowd. Can I give you an axiom that is ever so true? You must never let other people make up your mind or make up your mind for you. The only question that any of us should ask is the question that Pilate should have answered correctly. Is it right? Is this the truth? And if it is the truth... Stand for the truth, regardless of the masses of the crowd, regardless what they're crying and what they're saying. Pilate couldn't do it because it takes a miracle to stand for what is right. And as soon as you see it's right, do it. If you vacillate, then that's what Pilate did. He went in and out, back and forth. What? What shall I do? What shall I do? He vacillated when he should have stood for what was right the moment he saw it. We must take a stand for the truth no matter what people say. You know, people say to me, well, I don't know how to make a decision. Well, Jesus gave us a perfect example of how to make a decision. He made a decision there in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, after he had eaten the Last Supper with his disciples, they made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm going to show you what he did there. We are told he left eight of the disciples on the outside of the garden. He took three of them with him, Peter, James, and John. Judas had, had already gone. And he says to Peter, James, and John, now, now you stay over here, and you watch and you pray because I'm going to go over there. He separated himself from the eight and then he separated himself from the three and he went off alone. That's what the Bible describes. And he said to them, just tarry here and wait with me one hour. Now, have you ever thought, why did Jesus Christ leave these three over there by themselves? Two reasons. Number one, he was going to suffer like no man has ever suffered. And he couldn't bear to let them see it. 
He loved them that much. He didn't want them to see his suffering. He was in agony. Why was he in so much agony? Well, he was 33 years old. No 33-year-old man wants to die. If you get the impression out of the Bible that Jesus walked into the jaws of death easily, then you didn't see what was happening there at Gethsemane. Gethsemane settled the matter. You know, doing the will of God is not something that we particularly have an appetite to do. What you do with the will of God and when you do it, it's not because we have an appetite for it. We do it because it's right. Jesus had no appetite for death. We don't want to do things like that, that we don't feel like doing. Right? We need to be doing what's right. See, Pilate, he did what he felt rather than what was right. But the cross, well, that's where God's will goes one way and our will goes the other way. Jesus said, not my will, but thine. That's the cross. The cross has canceled I. The cross is where we accept God's will contrary to our own. That's what it took for Jesus to purchase for us eternal life. He had to go against his own feelings and do the will of the Father. But there's a second reason why Jesus didn't take Peter, James, and John with him. At the time of his prayer, you know, in, in earthly things, you know, we can ask the advice of our friends. But when it comes to the matter of our redemption, this is the path that no man, no woman can take anybody along with them. It's got to be walked alone. So here is a situation which he must not ask the advice of his friends. We must not ask the advice of our wife, our husband, our son, our daughter. It's between us and God alone. What if, what if the Lord had said to Peter, Peter, wake up, please. Peter, I'm not going to bother James and John here, but Peter, come over here. I want, I want to talk to you. Peter, I'm, I'm thinking about going to Jerusalem. I'm thinking about dying on a cross. Peter, what do you think I ought to do? What advice would Peter have given him? Peter would have said, Jesus, this is crazy. This is insane. Don't do it. No possible way. You see, in the decision that makes our eternal redemption, we do not dare ask anybody else. So Jesus left them behind. Here is something that he needed to work out in the loneliness of his own soul. The decision for salvation is one that must be worked out in a lonely way. And it's a miracle. So as we come to the close of the judgment scene, as always, the question is what to do with Jesus. The crowd will always choose Barabbas. But who will you choose today? Will you choose Jesus? He's wonderful. He's generous. He's kind. He's patient. He's good. Choose him. Now, please, you see, as soon as we say, Lord, thy will be done. And then if we do his will, then you're a miracle. Let it happen to you by the grace of our Lord. Please be a miracle today. Let's pray. Gracious God, loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the example of Jesus. You know, the greatest teacher that ever lived, but taught more through the actions of his life rather than the words that he spoke. Father, I just think of those that are crying out to you right now 
let your will be done in my life. Father, embrace them, accept them, empower them through your Holy Spirit. Bless each and every viewer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. Let me start out by thanking you for watching us. Just before we go, I want to remind you of a few things. First, our website, l4ltv.com. On the website, you can have access to all of our previous programs. You can uh, find out where I'll be appearing live. You can check out the archived sermons tab where I have different presentations on different topics done around the country. There's a video presentation. There's a, a handout you can download and study. Uh, so check out l4ltv.com. Also want to invite you to follow me on Instagram at Santos underscore Bill. Every morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern time, we put out a devotional, a little video. Great way to start your day. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter. Hey, before we go, I want you to check out missionnowcanada.com. That is the overseas humanitarian component of our ministry. We do some incredible work overseas. If you want to join us on an upcoming mission trip, if you want to make a donation to that cause, you can do so. MissionNowCanada.com. We are all out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And if I may be so bold to ask, why not let your friends and family know about us so maybe they can be with us next time. If they live outside of our geographical area where they can, we can be watched, refer them to the website l4ltv.com. God bless you guys. Hope to see you back here again next time.